Hello friends, Tom Boothlay here. Welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we will discuss cardiac axis determination. And I'm going to show you how to calculate the QRS axis in the frontal plane within five or 10 degrees at a glance. If you enjoy this content, I hope you will like and share and subscribe to my channel. In a previous video, we discussed the six step method for 12 lead ECG interpretation and step two was axis determination. So what's all the fuss? Why should you learn axis? Well, there are many reasons, but here's just a few. For one thing, understanding the heart's electrical axis will help you understand things like bifascicular blocks. And understanding the bifascicular patterns is one of the keys to understanding the differential diagnosis of wide complex tachycardias. It might also help you suspect the possibility that you're dealing with a pace rhythm, or perhaps that you have an electrolyte derangement or a right ventricular strain pattern. Understanding axis might help you suspect the possibility of misplaced leads, something like that. The bottom line is that when you understand the heart's electrical axis, it gives you a much more intimate relationship with the 12 lead ECG, and it really helps with pattern recognition over time. So if you wanna be an expert electrocardiographer, electrocardio you must learn access. The good news is this isn't that hard. So much has been made of this. I'm gonna show you three different ways to calculate the heart's electrical axis today. I use all three on pretty much every single 12 lead ECG because as you're gonna see, no one method works on every single ECG. So it's, it's a good thing to know multiple methods. When we're referring to the heart's electrical axis, what are we talking about here? Well, the heart's electrical axis is just the average direction of this depolarization wavefront. So even though during a cardiac cycle, you have millions of myocytes that are depolarizing in all kinds of different directions, if you average them in a particular direction, that's what we're talking about here, the so-called mean electrical vector. And one of the most basic concepts in electrocardiography is as this depolarization wavefront moves toward a positive electrode, you get an upright signal in that lead. Conversely, if it moves away from a positive electrode, you will get a negative signal in that lead. Or if it moves perpendicular across a positive electrode, you'll get a so-called equiphasic or isoelectric QRS complex that starts out positive as that wavefront approaches, but then ends up negative as that wavefront moves on by like you see there in the lower right-hand corner. That would be a perfectly isoelectric, meaning electrically neutral signal because it's just as much positive as it is negative. And this is the key to us identifying the axis in the frontal plane using this shape right here. This is known as the hex axial reference system that we're gonna use to help calculate the QRS axis in the frontal plane. If you wanna know the theory of where this comes from, I did write a six part tutorial on cardiac axis determination at ems12lead.com. I'll put that link in the show notes, but I'm just gonna give you sort of the speed version for today's video. You can think of leads one, two, and three as a triangle. So anatomically, this would be a scalene triangle because it has um, three different length sides. But because of Einthoven's law, we can think of this as an electrically equilateral triangle. And because lead one, lead two, and lead three each make up a vector, instead of writing these out as sides of a triangle, we can actually write them as intersecting in the middle. And when we represent leads one, two, and three this way, the arrowhead represents the positive electrode. And we can do the same thing with the augmented limb leads, leads AVR, AVL, and AVF. And so when we take these three leads and uh, redraw them, we represent them this way. So when we take this shape right here and combine it with the shape we created with leads one, two, and three, sort of lay them on top of one another, this is where the hex axial reference system comes from. And we just arbitrarily say that zero degrees is the positive electrode for lead one. But the easiest way to do this is to just sort of jump in. And uh, so again, I'm gonna show you three different ways to calculate the QRS axis today. 
we're going to start with a normal ECG. So a normal axis, or what we call the left inferior quadrant, this extends from zero to 90 degrees. So this would be the left inferior quadrant. In reality, a normal axis extends from about negative 30. So it, it creeps a little bit into the left superior quadrant, but a normal QRS axis is going to be in the neighborhood of negative 30 to 90 degrees. So if we take a look at this example, and we take a look at the first six leads here of this 12 lead ECG, because again, the hex axial reference system is made up of leads one, two, and three, and AVR, AVL, and AVF. And we say, what is the most equiphasic lead uh, of these six leads right here, you would say, well, it's lead AVL. So we know that the, the heart's mean electrical vector is perpendicular to the positive electrode for lead AVL. So which of these six leads is perpendicular to lead AVL in the hex axial reference system? Well, good news, instead of having to take out the hex axial reference system and just kind of squint your eyes and figure that out, there's a little trick I'm gonna show you to help determine that. And all you have to do is take the star of life, put it in the middle of these six leads, turn it on its side, and replace these blocks with arrows. And you end up with this shape, sort of a six-sided star uh, with one line going horizontally and then an X on top. And when we can do, when we do this, we can see that the perpendicular lead to lead AVL is lead two. And because the polarity of the QRS complex here in lead two is positive, we know that the QRS axis in the frontal plane is about 60 degrees here when we use the hex axial reference system. And if we look at the computerized measurement, we can see that the computer is measuring the QRS axis here at 55 degrees. So we've just nailed the QRS axis within five degrees using the hex axial reference system. Now, as I said in the six step method video, this probably seems really complicated or maybe even scary to someone that's not familiar with axis determination. Uh, but I told you then, and I'll tell you again, that this is really common because most people have an electrical axis that kind of goes in a right shoulder to left leg direction. So it's not at all uncommon for the equiphasic lead to be in lead AVL and for uh, the electrical axis to be pointing right at 60 degrees. So that's how this is really familiar to me because I do this all the time. So it's easy for me to remember which of these numbers corresponds to which leads. And that same thing is gonna happen to you when you start thinking in these terms, okay? So that's how we can peg the axis within, you know, five, 10 degrees at a glance. But there are other ways that we can determine the heart's electrical axis on this 12 lead ECG. For example, we can use what is called the quadrant method. And we know that the normal quadrant is the left inferior quadrant. So that is um, down there, you know, to the bottom in the left hand side. And as you can see from this shape right here, that would mean that we would have an upright QRS complex in lead one, because that makes up the horizontal spoke. And we'd have an upright QRS complex and lead AVL because that or AVF because that makes up the vertical spoke. So if we take a look at this normal ECG and we look at lead one and we look at lead AVF, do we have upright QRS complexes in both of these leads? The answer is yes. So we know that the heart's electrical axis has to be somewhere here in the left inferior quadrant. Now, again, as I told you, no one method is gonna work for every single ECG. We're gonna look at a lot of examples today and you're gonna be able to see that for yourself. So let's look at a third way, okay? So this is a speed method using leads one, two, and three. Sometimes people use one, two, and AVF for this, but I don't like to have to use any of the augmented limb leads when I teach this approach. Leads one, two, and three, one, two, and three were the original three leads in electrocardiography. So let's just use those three leads. Okay. So in this particular case, you'll notice that lead one is positive, has a positive QRS. Lead two has a positive QRS and lead three has a positive QRS. So using this particular method, we would know that we're somewhere between zero and 90 degrees. So three different methods, all proving that we have a normal axis on this particular ECG. Okay, that's our first example. Let's look at another one, okay? 
Now, um, take a look at this 12 lead ECG and look at the first six leads here and ask yourself, what is the most equiphasic or isoelectric lead of those first six leads? Well, okay, you would look at that and say, I think lead AVF has a very isoelectric, meaning very low voltage here. So we might suspect then that the heart's electrical axis is moving perpendicular to lead AVF. Using the same trick, remember star of life, put it on its side, replace those blocks with arrows. We can see that lead one is perpendicular to lead AVF in the hexaxial reference system. Okay. And we can see the polarity of lead one is positive. So if we go back to the hexaxial reference system and look for a positively deflected lead one, we're right at zero degrees here. Okay. And remember we said normal could be anywhere from negative 30 all the way to 90. So this is a normal axis, but it's pointing directly at the positive electrode um, in lead one. And if we check the computerized measurement, it's measuring the axis here at negative one. So we're only off by one degree, which is pretty darn good in a 360 degree circle. And by the way, it helps illustrate why no one method is the only method that you should rely on for axis determination. Because if we tried to use the quadrant method here, we're going to have a hard time placing this ECG into a quadrant because... Why? Because AVF is our equiphasic lead and the, and the mean electrical vector is moving directly at the positive electrode in lead one. So we can't use the quadrant method in this particular example. So if that's the only method you know, you're going to look at the CCG and go, huh, that's weird. Um, similarly, if we use the, uh, the speed method using one, two, and three, we can see we have an upright QRS complex in lead one and a slightly uh, positive QRS complex in lead two, uh, but then it's negative by lead three. So there is no one column that works here, but we know we're dealing with one of the first two columns or the only ones that would make any sense. So in this particular ECG, doing it the so-called hard way with the hexaxial ref reference system is actually the easiest way for this particular ECG. Okay, let's look at another one. All right. Take a look here. What do you think is the most equiphasic lead of the first six leads? Well, I'm sure you're looking at lead one. Again, what is our perpendicular lead here? Using uh, this little method here where we take the star of life on its side, well, it's lead AVF. And because AVF is positively deflected, when we look at the hexaxial reference system, we know that the electrical axis in the frontal plane is pointing straight down toward the patient's feet at 90 degrees. Once again, if we're gonna, and, and the computer's measuring this at 89. So again, we're only off by one degree here in a 360 degree circle, that's pretty darn good. Uh, but once again, we're gonna have difficulty using the quadrant system here because we have an equiphasic lead on one of the two spokes because this is pointing straight down at the positive electrode. So we can't really classify this as being in one quadrant or another. So this is not the optimal way. The quadrant method is uh, not useless here, but it's limited help for this particular ECG. Similarly, if we use leads one, two, and three, we'd be like, okay, well, we're not really sure if lead one is positive or neg negative. Um, so we would, we would know we're either normal or a slightly right axis here um, because we are literally right at the border zone because our axis is 90 degrees at this example. This is why I encourage everybody to know multiple uh, methods for axis determination, because what you're going to find out is you use all three all the time, um, because it's really the only way to really, really understand what you're looking at with a 12 lead ECG. Okay, let's look at another one. Okay, look at the first six leads here. What is the most equiphasic lead? Well, it's lead three. And by now, hopefully, you know that the perpendicular lead is lead AVR. Don't even need those arrows anymore, right? Your eye should just go from that equiphasic lead straight to lead AVR. And of course, as all of you know, lead AVR is always known as the Rodney Danger Field lead. So you'll notice that it's negative here instead of positive. This is the one little quirk in the hexaxial reference system is that the polarity of AVR is kind of like res um, reversed. 
So if we look down here at, at we actually have a negative QRS complex here for AVR when we're at 30 degrees in, but we're still in the normal quadrant between um, one and 90 degrees. And so if we check that against the computerized interpretation here, we have an R axis or a QRS axis of 29. Again, we're off by um, only one degree, which is pretty darn good. And we're still in the normal quadrant, the left inferior quadrant. Okay, well, how about the quadrant method? Well, in this case, um, it works just fine because lead one is positive and lead ABF is positive. So we can prove that we're somewhere here in the left inferior quadrant. Again, sometimes the quadrant method works just fine. Um, other times leads one, two, and three are the leads to use. Other times the hexaxial reference system makes the most sense. So um, if we're using leads one, two, and three in this particular case, lead one is positive, lead two is positive. Uh, lead three is equiphasic, but the closest one that matches would be right here. So we, we're still in that normal axis range of zero to 90 degrees, but again, not quite as satisfying as using the hex axial reference system in that particular case. All right, let's talk about the so-called physiologic left axis deviation. So this is when we start to creep up into the left superior quadrant, okay? Um, but only a little bit. So between zero and negative 30 degrees, um, still in the normal range, but just kind of creeping into the left superior quadrant here. And take a look at this ECG. Once again, um, we're looking for the equiphasic or isoelectric lead. I'm sure you're looking by now right here at lead two. And straight across from that would be the perpendicular lead, which is AVL. We have a positive QRS complex here. So we know that this QRS axis is right about negative 30 uh, degrees. And if we check that against the computerized interpretation, it's at negative 29. So we're within one degree here. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're about as far into the left superior quadrant and still be normal as we can get. Now, if we use the quadrant method for this particular ECG, we're going to have a positive QRS in lead one, we have a negative QRS complex in lead AVF. So we know we're somewhere in the left superior quadrant, which yes, that is a left axis deviation, but the quadrant method doesn't let us know if it's a so-called physiologic left axis deviation. We have no idea um, where that is between zero degrees and negative 90. We don't know if it's between zero and negative 30. But for that, guess what works really, really well in this particular instance? In this instance, using one leads one, two, and three is the key. So we have a positive QRS in lead one, we have an equiphasic in lead two, and we have a negative in lead three. So in this particular case, this is the ideal system to use um, this speed method use, using one, two, and three, uh, because this one really lets us see that we have a physiologic left axis deviation, not a pathological left axis deviation. Again, this is why I use all three methods all the time. It will just really, really deepen your understanding of 12 lead ECGs. Okay, let's talk about a so-called split axis. What do I mean by that? You might ask, and people do ask all the time, what if there is no particular lead in the first six leads of the 12 lead ECG that are truly equiphasic or isoelectric? What if it's a tie? What do you do then? Well, it's very simple. You calculate both and you split the difference. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So if you take a look at this ECG right here and say, what is the most equiphasic lead of these first six leads? You look at it and go, huh, there really isn't one. But if you say, what are the two smallest? You will go, okay, well, lead one uh, is about six millimeters you know, tall. Lead AVL is maybe five millimeters deep. Very, very close here. Uh, so let's say that, let's calculate them both. Okay, which two leads are perpendicular to lead one in AVL? Well, that would be lead two and lead AVF. So if we take a look at the hexaxial reference system and we have uh, lead two is 60 degrees, AVF is 90 degrees. If you split the difference, okay, because there's 30 degrees between 60 and 90, if you split the difference, you would say, eh, it's about 75. 
And so if you look at the computerized interpretation, bam, we just nailed it right there at 75 just by calculating both and splitting the difference. That's what I call a split axis because there wasn't either one that was perfectly. So I calculated them both and split it right down the middle. That's one way that you can do that. Now, every once in a while, you can't do that because you don't have a tie. So uh, usually you do, but not always. So there's one other way that you can do this where you kind of like, um, you, you, you kind of put in a little bit what I call a fudge factor and just kind of knock it over 10 degrees. And I'll show you what I'm talking about in this next case. And uh, so let's talk about a left axis deviation. And in this case, we're, going, we're talking about a pathologic left axis deviation. So we're in the left superior quadrant, but we're between negative 30 and negative 90 now. And um, so the left quadrant, the, the left superior quadrant goes from zero to negative 90, but again, physiologic left axis, zero to negative 30. So now we're really talking about a pathologic left axis deviation, negative 30 to negative 90. And uh, this is a perfect example of why I said it's important to uh, learn access. I would look at this right here. And the first thing that I would try and rule out is the possibility that I was dealing with a paced rhythm because you have a wide QRS complex with left bundle branch morphology in lead V1 and a left axis deviation. One glance at this and you have negative concordance in the precordial leads. We'll get to all this stuff in later videos, but this is why you learn access is an EKG just like this. Okay. But, it, but let's get back to axis determination, all right? If we go to these first six leads and say, well, what is the most equiphasic lead? Well, you would probably see, say, lead AVR, and there really isn't a tie here. If you look at lead two, it's not tied. I mean, it's unequivocally negative in lead two here. So the only one that you've really got is lead AVR, but there's no doubt about it. AVR is negatively deflected here. So we can go ahead and calculate uh, the QRS axis, but there's no doubt about it. This axis is moving slightly away more than just, you know, equiphasic. It has a slight bias to moving away from the positive electrode in lead AVR. And so we're going to have to maybe do a correction factor by about 10 degrees here, possibly. All right. Um, so what is our perpendicular lead to lead AVR? It is lead three. And lead three here it has a negative QRS complex. So if we go here to the hexaxial reference system, we're at negative 60. But remember, we weren't entirely happy because AVR wasn't perfectly, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't perfectly equiphasic. So what we want to do is move 10 degrees toward negative AVR here because AVR was slightly negative. Okay, in that example. So we're going to go ahead and bump that down uh, 10 degrees toward um, negative AVR. And that is going to bring us from 60 degrees to 50 degrees, negative 50 degrees. And if we look at the computerized measurement, we're at negative 45. Now, if you were happy just leaving it, hey, I get it. I'm not going to be exact because this one wasn't equiphasic and you would have just left it there at 60. You'd have been within 15 degrees. That's not too shabby, I guess, you know, but if you want to, you can do a slight correction by 10 degrees and just kind of bump it, in which case, um, you know, in, in which case you would bump it to 50 degrees and you would be within five, negative 50 degrees and you would be within five, um, which by the way is a left axis deviation. Now, in this particular case, this is really unsatisfying. Remember, um, I told you that no one method is perfect. In this particular case, if we use the quadrant method, yeah, it's going to show that lead one is positive and lead AVF is negative. You know you're somewhere in the left superior quadrant, uh, but again, we're not differentiating between a true pathologic left axis deviation and a so-called physiologic left axis deviation. So again, in this case, the best one of the three methods is the speed method using leads one, two, and three. Um, because in this particular case, Lead one is positive and leads two and three are both negative, um, proving that we're here in a pathological left axis deviation between negative 30 and negative 90. So in this particular case, leads one, two, and three tells the story. This is why you want to learn multiple methods. 
um, for axis, axis determination in the frontal plane. Okay, how about right axis deviation? All right, let's, uh, so now we're talking about 90 to 180 degrees, okay? We're, we're in the right inferior quadrant. So the axis is kind of pointing down toward the patient's right leg in this particular case. All right, well, in this case, let's go ahead and take a look and say in these first six leads, what is the most equiphasic lead? Okay, well, it's lead AVR. And what is perpendicular to lead AVR in the hexaxial reference system? Well, it's lead three. And lead three here is positively deflected. So if we look at the hexaxial reference system, we're at 120. And if we check the computerized interpretation, we're at 122, okay? Well, these are kind of uncommon. So I might not have remembered that on the hexaxial reference system that positive lead three equals 120. But if I saw that I had such a nice equiphasic lead and I saw that lead three was positively deflected and I looked at this computerized measurement, I'd be like, oh, okay, uh, 120. Because I can remember 90. 90 is one of the spokes. And if you add 30 to 90, you're at 120. And there's 30 degree distance between all of these spokes in the hex axial reference system. So I would have known that 120 was probably an accurate measurement. But again, I'm gonna use my other two methods. So if I use the quadrant method here um, and I take a look, lead one is negatively deflected, that's different. And lead AVF is positively deflected. So when we use the quadrant method here, we know we're somewhere in the right inferior quadrant, which is a right axis uh, deviation. Or if we use the speed method using leads one, two, and three, we can see that lead one uh, is negative and leads two and three are positive. Um, showing that we have a right axis deviation uh, on the ECG. Now, this ECG also happens to show a right ventricular strain pattern. Um, this was a, uh, a young lady with a congenital heart defect um, that our EMS system ran to several times. Say, okay, well, why learn axis? Because if you knew that this was a right ventricular strain pattern and a patient was presenting having an anxiety attack, uh, that, and she was saying that she was having chest discomfort, you wouldn't look at the right precordial leads, leads V1, V2, and V3 here and say, oh my gosh, look at that. We have, you know, we have some ischemic uh, ST segment depression here. That's not ischemic ST segment depression. That is a right ventricular strain pattern. Well, you wouldn't know that if you didn't understand axis determination, because that's the key to really knowing that this is a right ventricular strain pattern on the CCG. Okay. How about an extreme right axis deviation or maybe a right shoulder axis or a right superior axis? We're saying the same thing here. What about no man's land? This is hearts depolariz uh, depolarizing the opposite uh, of normal. We're here in the right superior quadrant between negative 90 and negative 180. Of course, first thing we're going to do is check and make sure that we don't have transposition of like the white and the red electrode, something like that. Um, but let's take a look at a case. And um, now granted, you might have more important things to worry about if you were on this call than the axis. Uh, but if you were to take a look here and say, okay, which of these is the equiphasic lead? Um, well, you know what? I'm gonna say this is a split axis right here. Um, slightly negative here in lead one, small and positive in AVL. Let's calculate both and split the difference. So what are our perpendicular leads here? Well, uh, AVF is perpendicular to lead one. Lead two is uh, perpendicular to lead AVL. We have a negative QRS in lead two and we have a negative QRS in lead AVF. So if we look at the hexaxial reference system, we're somewhere between negative 90 and negative um, 120. So, you know, there's 30 degree separation, right? So if we split the difference, we're going to be at negative 105. So we're going to take, you know, we're just going to split the difference, which is 15. So we're just going to add, you know, negative 15 on the uh, negative 90. We're going to come up with negative 105. And the QRS um, axis is measured at 100 degrees here. So splitting the difference, we're coming up with negative 105. It's got us within five degrees. Again, pretty good. You know, if you wanted, if you wanted to bother in this particular case, 
I would think that, you know, maybe not a priority on this particular call, since what you're dealing with here is uh, VTAC. Um, but a speed method, sure. If you use the quadrant method here, you are um, slightly negative here in lead one, and you are negatively deflected in lead AVF. So we know that we're in the right superior quadrant or the in extreme right axis deviation. Or in this case, look at leads uh, one, two, and three. And we have negative in one, negative in two, and negative in lead three. And so we're in the extreme axis category here using the speed method for leads uh, one, two, and three as well. So personally, my verdict, I'm glad I know all three methods for cardiac axis determination. I use all three methods all the time. Because again, as you'll see in clinical practice, sometimes, you know, if you're right on one of the spokes of the quadrant method, then, then doing it the so-called hard way with the hexaxial reference system will let you know you're right at 90 degrees or, or you know, right at zero degrees, something like that. Um, other times it's just fine, like a right axis deviation to just use lead um, one in, in AVF. Other times, like a physiologic left axis deviation, what you want to do is use the speed method using leads one, two, and three, a combination of methods to get the best uh, possible result. Okay, let's take everything that we've just learned and apply it to an actual case study using the six-step method. So I'm going to show you how to incorporate this now into your systematic evaluation of a 12-lead ECG. So let's say that EMS has been called out to evaluate a 77-year-old male with a chief complaint of syncope. So paramedics arrive on scene, get a set of vital signs, record this 12-lead ECG with the first set of vitals. Um, well, the first thing, we always start with rate and rhythm. And so the computerized measurement of the, of the heart rate up there is 77 beats a minute. And just getting an intuitive sense of this 12-lead ECG, it looks like a nice uh, regular rhythm but I always like to verify heart rate with my own eyes. So if we find a R wave here that lines up with one of the large blocks and we count out, we have one, two, three, four large blocks in between R waves. So we know that the heart rate is right around 75. So we can trust the computerized measurement here of 77 uh, beats a minute. And if we think about what is the heart rhythm Let's look for a lead that has good atrial complexes and good QRS complexes. Well, probably lead V1 has the best looking P waves here. Um, but you'll notice it has appears to have a prolonged PR interval. But when the P wave hits right in the middle of the R to R interval or really close, we have to conf confront the possibility that the QRS is superimposed on top of a P wave. So this could be a two to one rhythm, but if you were a Vegas odds maker, I'd say probably this is a um, sinus rhythm with a first degree AV block. The computer is measurizing the PR interval or measuring the PR interval at 252 uh, milliseconds, which is indeed prolonged. And the computer is calling this sinus rhythm with first degree AV block. I don't have that much trust in computerized algorithms, at least when it comes to cardiac rhythm analysis. Um, but that kind of matches my interpretation. So I like computerized interpretation. I just think we should always confirm it with our own eyes. So, so this appears to be a sinus rhythm uh, to me too. Okay, how about axis? Well, um, if we use the quadrant method, we can see that lead one is positive and lead AVF is negative, which would put us somewhere in the left superior quadrant. So we're looking at a left axis deviation but is it, is it a pathologic left axis deviation? Uh, for that, using the speed method with leads one, two, and three is the way to go for this particular case. So as you can see, we have uh, lead one is positive, lead two is negative, and lead three is negative, which would indicate we have a pathologic left axis deviation. Um, so this turns out to be the key to this particular case that is more informative than the quadrant method but a lot less cumbersome than using the hexaxial reference system. Because to do that, we would have to pick leads one and AVR as kind of a tie here as to which is the most isoelectric or equiphasic lead. And we would have to calculate both looking at leads three and AVF here, which would put us um, somewhere 
around between negative 60 and negative 90. If we split the difference, we'd say negative 75. And even though that does get us within three degrees, uh, which is pretty good, it's just cumbersome. It is a lot easier in this case just to look at lead one, two, and three and say it's a pathologic left axis deviation. Okay, so now let's look at intervals. We've already said that the PR interval is prolonged. How about the QRS duration? Well, the computer is measuring the QRS duration at 172 milliseconds. Is that wide? Yes. So when supraventricular rhythms are wide, we go to lead V1 and we see if we can uh, categorize this as a right or left bundle branch block. Well, since we have a terminal R wave here in lead V1, then we would consider this right bundle branch block morphology. When we have a right bundle branch block in lead V1 and a left axis deviation, that is one of our bifascicular patterns. We would call that right bundle branch block with left anterior fascicular block. Now, unlike rhythm analysis, where the computer isn't very good, they are pretty good at classifying right and left bundle branch block and bifascicular block. So in this particular case is a good example where axis is really adding information to this ECG interpretation. Otherwise, we would maybe stop at right bundle branch block, but we see we have right bundle with a left axis deviation here, letting us know that we have a bifascicular pattern on this 12 lead ECG. Guys, this has been Cardiac Axis Determination. I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to leave me a comment and let me know what you would like me to teach next. Hope you guys have a great day.